Welcome back. Uh, for those of you joining us now, uh, this is day four of Listen Up, the power of podcasting, Bulgaria's first podcast festival. Um, after a short break, we're back. And um, now with us, we have Jorge Caraballo Cordovez. Uh, he is one of the editors at Radio Ambulante. In just a minute, he'll tell us the incredible journey uh, of this uh, podcast. Um, in the meantime, just some housekeeping. Um, for those of you who want to ask Jorge some questions, please leave them in the Q&A section um, in this webinar. Uh, if you need translation, click on the interpretation button at the bottom of, of your screen and choose the Bulgarian channel. If you like to tweet about the festival or share some insights, use the hashtags listen up and podcast festival. Um, this is Bulgaria first podcast festival organized by the Association of European Journalists in the country and with the kind support of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation and America for Bulgaria uh, Foundation. And without further ado, um, I want to briefly introduce Jorge. I'm very grateful that he is with us today, and I'm sure uh, he has a lot of uh, incredible stories to tell. Uh, back in 2012, when Radio Ambulante was starting out, in Latin America, there were very few people who actually knew what a narrative podcast is. As we heard in the previous days of the festival, and if, if you were with us, uh, you know that this is traditionally an American genre in audio storytelling. But, um, well, eight years later, uh, it, it has become an award-winning podcast and uh, the only Spanish language podcast that is distributed by NPR. And um, Jorge now will tell us uh, how storytelling helped them build this podcast from scratch. Uh, hello, Jorge. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited. And he is joining us from uh, Colombia, where it's kind of early in the morning. So I'm glad that you have your morning coffee with us and take it away. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for Poriana for inviting me. And yeah, I will be describing you the journey of Radio Mulante. Uh, I think it's a very inspiring story. So I'm going to start sharing my screen and I will be happy to answer questions. So the title of this presentation is The Power of Narrative Audio Storytelling. And I think that that describes very well what Radio Mulante does because Radio Ambulante, like its DNA, it's audio storytelling. But at the beginning of Radio Ambulante, those who found it didn't know anything about how to produce audio storytelling. They were journalists, but they had no idea. They had never had a recorder in their hands. So they started from scratch, from zero. And right now it's a very successful project. So let's, let's start. At the beginning, they had some ideas, some certainties to begin with. The first one was that political borders are real, but cultural and linguistic borders are fluid, right? And this is very important in the context of Latin America, because in Latin America, there are more than 20 countries, but even though they are different politically, they are glued by the language, by Spanish. And that cultural, those cultural borders are much more fluid and are able, you, you can move them with storytelling, you can link them with storytelling. The second is that the United States is a Latin American country because there are more than 50 million people speaking Spanish there. So if that's not enough to call it a Latin American country, well, there are no more reasons. And the third one is that there is a very big opportunity to create a new outlet that has a, re that has a regional vision because there aren't that many. I don't know if in Europe there are some, but in Latin America, there are not that many outlets, news outlets or journalism organizations that are ambitious and that want to cover the region as a region and that can move from one region, one country to the other and explain and get together. So they saw that, but they 
start selling the idea to some friends and to, to some experts, but they got a little bit of bad advice. They said, hey, why are you doing that? Mexicans only care about Mexico. You're crazy. Why do you want to create a regional organization if people in their countries only want to know about their countries? Other people said, Latinos only want talk radio or music. That is this big stereotype, right? Of we only like to dance and to laugh out loud and to party, but you're not interested in news, right? And the third one, and maybe they had some uh, truth in this, is that no one knows what a podcast is. And this is real, right? In that moment, no one knew what a podcast was in Latin America. I'm talking about 2012, and I'm, I'm going to tell you what happened. The founders of Ambulante are Carolina Guerrero and Daniela Larcón. She is from Colombia. He is from Peru, but both of them had migrated to the United States and had been living there for years and years. Uh, they were living in California and they started attending these Latin American parties, Latin American gatherings, and they knew by experience that people from Cuba wanted to know what was happening in Colombia and people from Peru, they wanted to know if there was some update from Mexico. And this regional conversation that they were seeing in this small scale was the kind of conversation that they wanted to trigger with journalism in Radio Ambulante. This is where the story began. As I told you, they had no idea about audio. Daniel had only had an experience. He's a, he's a very uh, well-known journalist in, in Latin America and in the United States, but he had been doing, right? He had been writing, right? for magazines. And he had one experience with the BBC in which uh, they asked him to go to Peru to do this um, audio documentary. And he did a lot of interviews in Spanish and he loved those interviews he did. Then he passed them to the editors of the BBC. And when he heard the final piece, all those audios that he had interviewed that he had recorded in Spanish were translated to English and he was like oh no why like th that Spanish that those accents were so rich and now they're lost because they have a translator on top of them so in 2011 they were in this kind of professional transition and in this cafe in San Francisco They were like, okay, what do we do? Sorry for the ambulance. What do we do? And Daniel said, why don't we do this radio thing? And this radio thing was the idea of let's do a narrative podcast as those that we love in the US, this American life, radio lab, snap judgment, but let's do it in Spanish. Let's tell Latin American stories. And from that conversation, in that corner, in that cafe, Radio Volante was born. And this is very important in the story because the first thing that they did was this, a bake sale. They started selling literally muffins and cookies to raise some money. And this was the, big, the very, very, very beginning, the foundation of Radio Volante. They are in that yard selling lemonade, muffins and cookies to raise some money because they had invested all that they had uh, buying recorders and uh, designing the logo and they had no more money. They needed the support and they needed some validation. They needed to test the idea and see if people were willing to pay for it and to support it. So after that bake sale, they, they did a Kickstarter and Radio Ambulante was the first podcast in any language to create, to launch a Kickstarter. Uh, and this crowdfunding campaign had a goal of $40,000. They raised those $40,000. Actually, they got $46,000 in the Kickstarter and they got supported by 600 backers, 600 people that said, I, I, have, I have not listened to any episode of this, The, like, I believe that this is important. I support your idea and I trust that you will be able to do it. So 
that validation, that social validation was the first, like the Kickstarter, literally, for Radio Ambulante. They started doing these interviews uh, in different countries of the U.S., uh, different countries of Latin America, including the U.S., and they launched the first episode in 2012. That year, 2012, after all that effort, uh, they got 7,000 downloads. And for them in that moment, it was like, my God, this is a complete success. Like, we, we, this is a home run, right? We never expected to have so much downloads, 7,000 downloads. Now, two years later, they got 75,000 downloads. And wow, this is good. And they were, they were producing around like six, eight episodes a year. That's not that much. In 2014, 700,000 downloads, that's great. And in 2016, they joined NPR, uh, the National Public Radio of the US, which was like a rocket for numbers. And now you're gonna see 2020, today, this year, we're projected to have 8 million, 8.5 million downloads. And what I want to tell you is how we did that. This is a graphic of the growth of Radio Ambulante. As you see, after 2016, when we joined NPR, the numbers are going, are growing much, much higher. Uh, the catalog of Radio Ambulante has more than 200 episodes and 25 million downloads in these eight years. And we are including numbers of El Hilo, that is our second podcast and that I will present to you later. Some numbers that are important uh, as an overview. We have an annual budget of around a million and a half dollars. Uh, and that seems a lot, but you will see we have 20 staff members across the world, full-time members. They started like literally two people, Daniela and Carolina. Then they were joined by other three people, other three women. And they were five for around four years before joining NPR. And during those first five years of Radio Ambulante, any of them got a salary. They were doing this as a side job. They were doing this as something that was like their passion, but they were not getting any dollar out of it. Then we have, right now we have two distinctly different shows. We have Radio Ambulante and El Hilo. Uh, uh, and we produce around 85 episodes every year. Uh, in terms of budget, so you can understand how this is fine, this is sustainable right now. There are like 50% of, of the share of our budget is thanks to foundations, grants that they give us as a very essential support to keep going. 20% comes from NPR, National Public Radio. We are independent of NPR, but NPR distribute the podcast. So from that agreement, distribution agreement, we get 20% of our income. Then Lupa, which is an app for Spanish learners that use Radio Ambulante, that I will also talk later, we get 10%. And finally, from listeners, we get 20% of our budget right now. 60% of all listeners live in the US. Uh, that's important because it was founded in the US. Um, and podcast culture, as Oriana said at the beginning, is growing mainly, it's coming mainly from the US, right? It, they were created there and there is a big, big culture of listening to podcasts. So that's why it's so relevant in terms of numbers. 30% of our listeners live in Latin America and 20% are Spanish learners, which is something that it's a big opportunity for us. Many people are learning Spanish thanks to Radio Ambulante. And this is a picture of the team. This is a recent picture of the team. We are all over the world. There are people in Mexico, Guatemala, Nicaragua. There are people in Argentina, Chile, the US, Spain, everywhere. All Latin American. And right now I want to describe and to like, present what do we do and why when I say that narrative journalism has been like the fuel 
uh, of, or the mother of Fray Ambulante, uh, what does it mean, right? So we have done all this journey that I just presented. We have grown from a team of two to 20 to have 7,000 downloads to eight and a half million because we do narrative journalism in audio. This could be a completely different story if we were doing a podcast of interviews or a podcast of news, it would be completely different. The success of Radio Ambulante is based on stories, on good stories. And we have learned some things about storytelling in that process. So I'm gonna explain or describe what a good story has, right? First of all, if you are doing a narrative journalism podcast, you need to have, and this is like essential, you need to have good characters because you may find the perfect story. You may find a story that you say, this is something that will become viral, so popular, everyone will be engaged with it, everyone will be talking about it. And that may be true, it may be a great story. But if the characters of that story are not eloquent, are not good describing the situation with their voices, then it may be a good story for a magazine, but maybe not for audio. If you're doing audio, the voices of the characters need to be so powerful that you are listening and you are there in the edge of your seat all the time because they are keeping you focus on what they're telling. And it's not only necessary to have characters, that's the main condition, that's the first condition. If you want to do stories told by the characters, they need to be powerful, but those characters need to give you three different things, right? When we're talking about good characters is because they're good narrating, describing and interpreting what they're saying. And I'm gonna show you some examples of our work that display these kind of things. When we're talking about tape, and just this, like, if this is something to clarify, when I'm talking about kinds of tape, tape is the pieces of the interview that you include in the podcast, right? You go outside, you report, you get 20 hours of interviews and the tape is those fragments of the interview that you will include in the final piece, in the final podcast, okay? So let's listen to some examples of narrative, descriptive, and interpretive podcast of tape. First, narrative tape. Uh, this is an episode called The Long Road. Uh, it's an episode that we published in 2017, and it describes or it presents the story of some migrants that are literally walking from Ecuador to the United States. That is a, almost a complete continent, right? So this is thousands and thousands of kilometers that they're walking through jungles because they want to get to the US and they have no money to pay a, a boat. They have no chances to take a plane because they don't have documents or legal documents to get inside the US. So they have to walk. So let's listen. Este, lo encontramos en el camino, él se había separado de su grupo porque tenía un pie lastimado. Ya no podía caminar con la misma rapidez que caminaban los otros, entonces se quedó, se quedó solo. Continuaron el camino juntos y el indio fue muy amable al compartir con ellos un poco del arroz que cargaba en su bulto. Nada, él se refugió ahí con nosotros, acá un poco nosotros esa noche, pero ya el otro día ya se tuvo que quedar. O comenzamos la caminata de nuevo temprano, temprano ya cuando estaba aclarando. Pero ya se empezó a quedar atrás y empezó a quedar atrás. Nosotros nos quedábamos con él, pero ya hubo un momento que tuvimos que dejarlo. So, as you see, or as, as you listen, Joandra, she's focusing on actions. When we're talking about narrative tape, this is tape, or this is the pieces of the interview, when the character is connecting Actions, 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 actions that are building towards an end, right? But she is not talking about the environment. She's not talking about how she was feeling. She is talking about what was happening. And this is essential. If you're doing narrative journalism, you need those kind of actions because the 
structure of your podcast is based on that something needs to happen. And the character is telling what is happening. It's much more powerful when the characters tell you what's happening than that the host or uh, the narrator describes you. Because when the character is telling you what happened, you are there with them. You are living that with them. Let's listen to another piece of that interview. Yo me iría para todos lados y dije, yo ando con mi hermano, ando con un niño. ¿Y qué hago? Yo no puedo quedarme. Y no tenía fuerza para cargarlo tampoco, no. Querían ayudarlo, pero no pudieron. Realmente fue muy duro tener que dejar a ese hombre detrás. Es muy duro, muy duro. A mí me partió el alma y a mí hasta los ojos se me aguaron. Le dije yo, ah, o él o nosotros, ¿qué hacemos? Traemos al niño. Y hubo que dejarlo allí. Hubo que dejarlo allí. Ya no podía caminar. So they lived him there. That's what happened. They found someone in the jungle. They went along with him. He was uh, hurt. And then, even though they wanted to keep helping him, they had to leave him. Those are the actions that they're describing very powerfully. Now, let's listen to some descriptive tape, right? Tape that makes you feel where the characters are in the moment they're telling the story. And this is from an episode called The Stowaways that was the very first episode of Ryan Ambulante. This is the story of two friends who migrated from Peru to the United States, hidden in a big ship. And their trip during the ocean was a little bit intense. Al día siguiente, el barco emprendió su camino. Llevaba toneladas de carga de fruta, de verdura. Llevaba 200 estibadores de más de una docena de países y dos jóvenes peruanos. Bien escondiditos en la última bodega. Mayer y su amigo Mario, cada quien acostado, agarrado de una tabla de madera en la oscuridad total. No se veía nada, nomás que el flashlight lo usábamos para comer, para, para mirarnos, para preguntarnos cosas y lo apagábamos. Y así. Y sentíamos siempre el pum, pum de la mar, ¿no? Y el movimiento del, 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 del barco, pues pum, 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 pum. Eso siempre lo sentíamos. As you, as you just heard, Major did something that we are always looking when we're doing interviews. And that is that when they're describing the situation, you feel there with them. When he says, we were listening to the sound of the sea, boom, boom, or the ship, boom, 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 boom. Those vocal sounds are gold in podcasts, in narrative journalism, because they make you feel, they make you be there. They recreate the complete situation with the power of the voice, right? Voice is everything. With the voice, you can, and this is like the main instrument of storytelling since we are humans, right? And that pum, 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 pum is, I'm taking you there with me and we're gonna live together again this thing. But he's also describing, and the narrator of the story too, how dark it was, how wet it was, how frightening it was, right? So those voices are your eyes and you want that people can imagine what you're describing. Finally, let's talk about the interpretive tape, right? And this is the part of the tape where the characters are reflecting on what they are describing and what they are feeling, right? So this is something very important because if you don't have this, you will have a set of actions and you will have some description but there will be something missing. And what's missing is the most important in a story and is what does this mean? Why is this important? Why am I listening to this, right? So it would be a little bit easy if you as a narrator answer that question. You should be listening to this story because this and that. We don't want that. We want them, the characters, to let you know why that story is important. So let's listen to an example. 
esto de emigrar además de que estás lejos de tu familia es como que no te terminas de ir de Venezuela cada vez que pasa algo en Venezuela te afecta directamente acá nosotros ahorita estamos y no estamos estamos aquí como nos podemos ir a otro país como nos podemos ir a otro y a otro porque simplemente nuestra vida cabe en una maleta nuestra vida es una maleta se convirtió en eso y siendo casi como nos vinimos nos podemos ir y nos tenemos que ir nos tenemos que ir As you listen, she's Ana Mer, who is a Venezuelan who is living in Peru. She is explaining and she's opening herself on what does, how does she feel being a migrant right now, being a Venezuelan migrant right now, right? She's saying, my life is this, my life is a suitcase. Like I need to keep going. I have no place, I, 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 I'm, I'm baseless, right? And that interpretive tape shines a light on all the actions that he had, that she had uh, presented before. Let's listen to another example of interpretive tape. And this is called, this is from an episode called The Coyote. Coyotes, just for context, is how people call the, the, um, those who help migrants in the border of the US and Mexico to cross into the US. So it's a job, right? It's a job of, I'm gonna, let migrants pay coyotes or smugglers to help them cross the border, right? So let's listen to a coyote explain his job and what does it mean? Según las autoridades de nuestro país, somos unos delincuentes, todo el que es coyote. Muchas veces también ayudamos a muchos indocumentados. Después que terminas un trabajo, un viaje, te quedas con el sentimiento de que hiciste buenos amigos. Porque vas en el camino y las empiezas a tomar afecto a aquellas personas. Van buscando el sueño americano, van confiando en ti, vas ganando dinero y se siente bien. Si sí existe el sueño americano. Yo viví el sueño americano. ¿Tú crees que van a tapar esa frontera a los gringos así por así? No la tapan, hombre. Eso no lo para. Eso es imposible que paren eso. Si la tapan, hacemos un hoyo y lo metemos por bajo la tierra. Pero tenemos que llegar. So Carlos, the coyote, the smuggler, he's just being so honest on why does he do this job. This is something that no one, no authority, even the authority of, of the U.S. can stop it, right? They migrants from all over Latin America, they want to get to this country because there is a dream, an American dream, and they will get there however they can. And something that he does and something that is very important about the interpretive tape is that this is kind of, this is the kind of tape that demolishes stereotypes. And that's something that we always do. We don't want to tell the stories of others. Because when you tell the stories of others, it's very, very likely that you will do some judgments that may not be true, right? You are putting your words and your labels on others. But when are others, when, when are the main characters that tell you their stories, they are them, right? And they are who they are. And when we do this kind of journalism, we do want to do that. We want to get around stereotypes and show the real people. Second, you not only need good characters that do these kind of things that we just described, you also need a story arc. And this is essential. Why? Because it's very, very different to say, a series of things that happened, series of events that happened versus a series of actions that build on each other and conclude in a real and surprising end, right? A solution. So I'm going to show you a very small version of a story arc, right? The story arc is something that happens during all the episodes. You present the character, the character faces a conflict, the conflict 
demands a series of the actions from the character and during those car during those actions the character transform himself or herself and finally there is a solution that's the art right the introduction the conflict the solution and you will find that structure in all the episodes of Raya Mulanti. You will find that structure in all the episodes of This American Life, for example, right? Or other narrative podcasts that you listen to. Uh, but I'm going to show you a very tiny fragment of a story arc described by a character in an episode called Exodus. Tengo 37 años, vengo del Tigre, estado en Suárez y soy profesora en educación integral. Para ese entonces, Yaretsi llevaba dos meses viviendo en el campamento con su familia. Bueno, mi carpa es de cuatro personas, dormimos cuatro, mis dos hijas, eh, mi esposo y yo. Esa misma carpa la compraron en Venezuela para irse de vacaciones. Era para ir a la playa como costumbre, como hacíamos buen venezolano para... Este, ¿cómo es? Vacacionar para una Semana Santa, carnaval, pasar dos, tres días en la playa. Pero en vista de la situación, más nunca lo usamos y después, eh, que no quedó de otra sino traerla como casa para acá, para, para Caraima. So, Yaretsi just did a complete arc, right? This is the introduction of the character. We are here in this refugee camp. Uh, she's introducing herself with whom she lives, right? With her daughter, with her husband. And then she's presenting, she's talking about this tent that they bought in Canada, in, in Venezuela for vacations, but that now is their own home, right? And you want to know as a listener why this family that had bought a tent for vacations ended up in a refugee camp living there, right? So what the stuff, what the episode will do and what the episode, how the episode will develop is to show you and to present you the travel, the journey of the character. So at, besides having good characters and a story art, you need other things that we will not go into right now. You will need, for example, very good audio or sound design. Right? Do you remember the tape of the stowaways of those friends who were in the ship? You were listening to the ship, right? Because there were some sound effects that made you feel there. You also need, for example, archive audio, right? Audio from the past, from news, from a TV that is essential to recreate those stories that go to that talk about the past. You need humor. Humor is super important to make you feel engaged and close to the characters. You need other elements. But if you don't have the ability, the skills, the money to do very good sound design, to dig into archive sound, the essential is you need to find good characters and you need to find very you you need to elaborate a very good narrative arc there are some things that we've learned doing this and that i think that may be useful for anyone who is planning to launch a narrative podcast first is that the narrative conflict is essential if you don't have a conflict it's unlikely that people will that listeners will stay in the episode right because When we're doing audio, we are demanding a lot of attention from people. This is not like a social media video. This is not like a, a news piece that you read online that you can just scroll down quickly and scan the text. This is when you're listening to an episode, you have to be fully, fully focused because if you're not, And you will miss, and if, you, if your attention comes two minutes later, you may be completely lost, right? So the narrative conflict is if, it's a, if it, it is a very like solid and strong conflict will make you stay because you want to know what will happen next. So when you're thinking about narrative audio, always go back 
to the conflict. What is the conflict of this story? And why this character is taking these actions? And you need to hold the answer to the question, what will happen next until the very end? So if you have a good narrative conflict, you will have attention. Second, listeners also travel through the conflict. If it's a good conflict, you will, as a listener, you will be engaged because you want to live, you want to have that experience, you want to be transformed by it. Third, listening to others redefines your identity. And this is true for Radio Ambulante and for its community. When we get messages from listeners, there is a, there is a trend in them. And is that you, they, they tell us, Radio Ambulante expands my universe. It expands my identity. I felt like you see in that illustration, I felt isolated, right? I felt Colombian, where I felt Bolivian, where I felt Mexican, but I didn't know that the stories from people in other countries were going to engage me that much and were going to make me feel in a different way about my identity. So this is something that happens when you listen to others, not necessarily when you read about others. When you, when you listen to stories told by their characters, there is a relationship that you establish there that helps you think about your identity in a different way. And this is something tr like those are, I think, one of the most powerful things about podcasts. For a good story is universal, right? Like I could listen a story about a small town in the south of Argentina that is thousands and thousands of kilometers away from me. And it may engage me because a good story, it doesn't matter where it happens. If it's human, it's universal. And that's what we try to do in every episode. We go local in every week. Ambulante publishes episodes every week, every Tuesday, uh, 30 episodes a year. And in every episode, we ask ourselves, is this story universal? Is this story going to be relevant and engaging for, to someone who is from a different place? And if, this, if the answer is no, then the story doesn't work. If the answer is yes, when we publish it. Finally, we ask ourselves, and we always ask ourselves, which voice are being left out? because it's not enough to publish a story about a, a character if his or her point of view is not completed, complemented by others, even if they have opposite views. So always ask yourself, which voices are being left out and how can we include them? There are some advantages of telling audio stories that I want to briefly describe. First is that your ears understand the, the digital world in a more complete way than any other of your senses. And I want to stop a little bit here. Podcasts are a digital media, right? It's a digital medium. This is completely digital. This is a product of the internet. It was created in 2003, 2004. Uh, so this is not related at all to other technologies. The previous technology that had such an impact on how we organize ourselves besides the internet, before the internet was the, the print, the printing press. And in the printing press, as Marshall McLuhan says, and you may know, the printing press demanded a relationship with the information that was based on the on the eyes, on the view. Your, it, it was like a frontal view. The internet, in contrast, demands the attention in a different way. And the main sense to relate yourself to, uh, to yeah, to be part of that environment is the ears because. The internet is like a conversation that never, never stops. The information is always flowing and you cannot shut it. You cannot shut it down. So 
as the ears, you're always listening to your environment. So the ears listening is the principal way of relating yourself with the internet. And that, will, that is proving to be true and that will be true in the future. You will see that the internet will not necessarily be on screens, but will be everywhere. And the ears will be the main way to interact with it. So podcasts are digital and listening helps you to understand this new technology and this new reality that we have. Second, podcasts welcome silence and attention. There are virtuous that are virtues that paradoxically, paradoxically we're losing right now, right? We are so distracted, so saturated with information from screens. We're, we feel sometimes that there's so much noise that we just want to disconnect and to do something else because yeah, we're bombarded. But podcasts take you away from that. And that's a big opportunity because if you do a good, good podcast, the listener will have to be silent for a while and will be focusing for a while. But that's something that is not happening, that is happening less and less when you're in front of a screen. And that's something that they will appreciate and that they will come again to you if you do it right. Third, the, a good advantage of podcasts is that you feel as a listener that you, the favorite podcast, your favorite podcasts are made just for you. And this is something related with the first point. On the internet, what was called the audience, right? Imagine radio or imagine television when the producers of information, they, they crafted this documentary. They published it on radio and it was listened by, we don't know how many people, but they had no idea as producers who were listening to their shows. They could do service and all that, but they had no real live information of who were listening. On the internet, when you are able to create networks, live networks, you know who's listening to you. And if you do know who's listening to you, then your podcast need to talk to the, that only person. Re talk to one person when you do your podcast, produce it as you were talking to just one person, as it was your friend. And if you do it in that way, first, you're doing actually a podcast. And second, you will have a new relationship and a very strong engaged relationship that will, be, that will help you to make this sustainable in time. And finally, podcast trigger conversations and encourage reciprocity. That is something that for us is essential because that reciprocity is what makes Radio Ambulante sustainable. People want to, they listen to us, but they also want to participate and want to help you, help us succeed. And I will show you how. Communities around podcasts, and this is related to, to the previous one, are more participative and invested in a project. And this is a very, like, if, if I was selling arguments for why to do a podcast and not um, online magazine, this would be the first one. With podcasts, you create communities, strong communities that will, that will participate and will invest in your project. We have some current challenges right now. Uh, the first one is to foster real life interactions. And when I talk about challenges, it's things that are, we are, we're tackling and that we want to, to solve because we know that these are opportunities for us. So th this one is important. We are a digital project, but we also want to move and create interactions in presence, in person. So we created the listening clubs. And this has been one of the most amazing strategies that we have created to engage with our listeners. All those people that you see in the table are listeners, listeners of Radio Ambulante that created their own club after we gave them all the resources and like all the, the know-how. And they discussed the episode 
and after listening to the after listening to the episode, they discuss about it. We have done more than 250 listening clubs in more than 50 countries. More than 3,000 people uh, have gathering and listen to the episodes and talk about them. This is a map of last year, September, when we launched our ninth season. 75 clubs in simultaneous happened to listen to that episode. Every dot there, it represents people that may be strangers to each other, but that they knew that they shared the interest of Radio Ambulante. So they gather in their cities, thanks to a website that we created, they, they connected themselves, they gather in their cities, and they listen to this episode and talk about it. And many, many, many of those clubs are still going, are still happening. After the, the coronavirus, they're happening online. Another uh, opportunity or challenge is, okay, there are, we have a very strong community, like a big, big community. How do we do to connect themselves? How do we do? So it's not Radio Ambulante talking to like isolated people, but how do we connect themselves? How do we present listeners to each other as we do in the listening clubs and to celebrate this community and to share this, this joy of having a common interest that is the interest about Latin America and its identities. So we created Zoom parties. These Zoom parties may sound a little bit creepy. It's like, how do you do a Zoom party? Like, why do you do a Zoom party? And it was an experiment. We wanted to see if in this complicated situation of the virus, we could gather in a Zoom meeting because we could not gather in person as we were doing in the listening clubs and celebrate and have something, have a reason to be happy, right? Because everything seems so dark. So in May, we organized the first party and it was a complete success. This is people from all over the world with customs, with signs, dancing, with their cameras on, celebrating good music, good Latin American music, and enjoying together. And for us, and I think I'm not exaggerating, this has been maybe the most important moment in Radio Ambulante's journey, when we understood that people trusted so much in us that they were willing to turn on their cameras to show us their homes, to show us their families, their kids, their pets. And not only to us as Radio Ambulante, but to other members of the community. This party was the, the, the proof that we had created, or we had not created, we had connected a community, a generous participative community. And when you are able to do that, you are validated. You feel that, yes, this is something more than a podcast. Radio Ambulante is not only a podcast. Radio Ambulante is this. And if you know how to uh, engage with this community and to connect it, then you have uh, very good chances to survive economically and to keep growing and growing and growing. And that's something that we're going to talk uh, in deep uh, tomorrow in the workshop, the engagement workshop. Another challenge is to break the language barrier because we have these amazing stories of all over Latin America, but they're in Spanish. And yeah, not everyone talks Spanish. So how do we do so others that don't speak Spanish can enjoy the stories? So we created Lupa. And Lupa is an app that uh, is designed for Spanish learners that uses many different technological levers so you can create the stories, understand them, enjoy them, and also learn Spanish. You can keep track of new words, like you can add words to your uh, personal vocabulary. You can keep your ears working by showing only the words you need. So you can like listen to the episode and then the most difficult questions, they will be shown to you, but 
the most easy ones, you, they will be hidden, but you will know what's going on. Uh, you can set the speed, and also you can quick access, like you have access to real-time information. And finally, another challenge is to launch new podcasts because Ryan Blante is successful and we were ready to take a new, new challenge. So we are not, we now are not only Radio Ambulante, we are called Radio Ambulante Studios because we produce Radio Ambulante and El Hilo. El Hilo is a, a news podcast. It, it, it's also weekly as Radio Ambulante, but its focus is that every, like it, the premise is that every week we cover the most urgent news of Latin America, but with narrative journalism, right? So let's listen just to a, a, a short piece of what does it look like? What does it sound like? ¿Y cuándo se dieron cuenta que la situación era grave? Como por el 23, 24 de marzo, me dicen que la situación de emergencia es caótica, llegan personas ya prácticamente a morir. Eh, Literal. Literalmente llegan a morir porque todo, absolutamente todo está lleno, está colapsado. Todas las tomas de oxígeno ya no hay más, eh, ya no hay más ventiladores y lo que hacen mis compañeros es darles una muerte digna a las personas que, que van llegando. Que según cuentan diariamente a mi hospital son como aproximadamente 30 personas por guardia. 30 que fallecen no son 30 que llegan. Son 30 que llegan a morir. This is one of the first episodes of El Hilo uh, that describes the situation in, uh, in hospitals in Ecuador. And as you see, you have a strong character, you have a sequence of actions, you have description of what's going on, how does it look like, and of course in the episode you will also listen to some interpretive tape. And finally, and I want to open to questions, all this, all what I have described, all, all that journey from the little idea in that cafe to this Zoom party, to this new podcast, to this growth of Ayamulante, has led us to understand that people, they want to participate and they want to support us. So we created a membership program because at the end, in the long run, to have these kind of projects can be sustainable only if you're independent, right? So we want to facilitate listeners to help us grow and help us keep doing this. So we created the ambulantes. This is a game of words because the, the prefix de, the first two letters, also mean off. So when you read this together, it means of ambulante or of Rai ambulante. They are part of Rai ambulante. We have these amazing like ads that we that we publish to yeah convince, persuade listeners to join in the program and to support us. Right now we are on campaign and we are set to raised more than $70,000 in November and December, which is a very, very important share of our budget. And it's happening. We're getting there. We're going to that goal. We're close to that goal. And it's thanks to, to listeners that we will be able to do this job to produce Radio Ambulante and to produce a little in 2021. So this is it. Uh, if, you, if you do narrative audio journalism in a very well-crafted way, you will be able to connect in a deep way with listeners. So they will be closing the feedback, like the, 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 the loop, they will be closing the loop. You will be doing this for them and then they will be doing for you what you need to keep doing that service to them. So it's a beautiful circle that we've been designing, learning from it, iterating in these eight years. And I will be happy to, to listen to questions. And tomorrow we will be talking about how specifically we engage with listeners. So thank you a lot. I'm happy to answer some questions. 
Thank you, Jorge, so much for this very ins insightful presentation. Wow, uh, it was really an incredible journey, as you said, from that coffee shop to where you're now having uh, so many listeners around the world and this community that is obviously growing. Yeah, I actually have a zillion questions, but um, I want to touch briefly on this kind of offline <laughs> Um, methods that you chose to to develop your community what, what was the inspiration of creating those listening clubs I mean now they moved online obviously mm -hmm. but previously they were held in person yeah the, the inspiration came from social media like it started digitally but we were seeing this post on Twitter on Facebook of people listening to the episodes with their parents while they were cutting potatoes in the kitchen or people during their lunch break in their works talking about Rayambulante, listening to a Rayambulante and talking about it. And we were like, why are these conversations happening in these private circles? How can we open them? How, how can we bring more people to these conversations? And also we were trying to understand why podcasts that everyone talks about being the most intimate medium why are people listening to it collectively? And how does it feel to listen to an episode together? Why, what can you learn from an episode listening to it together? And we did a pilot on 2019, early 2019, last year, with some clubs in different Latin American cities. We did 20 clubs in 10 cities. And each of those clubs were run by a Radio Ambulante member. And we only invited 15 listeners for each of those clubs to see what happened. And the first club, I'm, I'm just going to may, let, like, explain what happened on the first club. The first club about was a, of that episode that it's called Exodus, that I just mentioned you in the presentation of the narrative arc about Venezuelan migrants. So we listened to that episode and it was happening in Medellin, in my city where I'm based right now. And, so people from Colombia, where we've seen a big Venezuelan migration, but we were mostly Colombians, right, on the table. So we listened to the episode, it was very moving, it was something that was close to us, but then someone raised her hand and she said, that story that we just listened, that experience that we just listened, is the experience of my family. I'm from Venezuela and all that journey that that character is describing, it's a journey that my friends and my family are living right now. And we were like, oh my God, we were talking about this as if, as if it was the story of others, but actually it's the story of real human beings that are right here in the table with me. And we podcast are listening in a community. It is very likely that the different point of views will expand the story and will make that story richer because you will learn how it, how it impacted others. So listening clubs are that, like the inspiration was that, to open up the conversation that was happening around Radio Ambulante and also to have these civic gatherings that make the stories even richer and yeah, facilitate the connection of our network. Yeah, that, that's quite interesting that, you know, people start engaging and probably sharing stories, etc. Did it lead to some, let's say, story ideas uh, afterwards? Did the listeners um, inspired you to, to develop the like new new narratives? Yeah, definitely. As a, it, as a result from those listening clubs. Yeah, not only, it, not necessarily story ideas, but they have like the listening clubs have helped us editorially because we have published or we have listened to episodes that haven't been published. Uh, and then we listen to the feedback of the community of the, of the attendees. And then we say like, oh, there is, a, there is something missing here in this episode. We need to explain this, or this is completely like, we cannot say this, this is offensive, whatever. Like, we, we, we get this, we get that feedback and we adjust the episode and then we publish it. So it's like a focal group, right? But we didn't intend it to be like that, but it helps you editorially to, to take better decisions. 
So in a way, the listeners become like a uh, part of the story. They cooperated with you by bringing their insight and kind of enriching uh, the reporting that you've already done. Definitely, definitely. And that's so exciting. Yeah, exactly. Also, I, I just cannot help but ask about the Zumba uh, <laughs> clubs. I mean, it sounds so fu- so much fun. I, I feel like having like a Zoom party right now, maybe. <laughs> Uh, well, to, to, too bad yeah. we didn't think about it as part of the festival, but next, next time uh, <laughs> I will invite you as a Zumba coach maybe. But, but tell me, were you expecting such engagement from, uh, from the people? I mean, you know, uh, all of us are by now probably sick and tired by, you know, interacting with uh, people over Zoom. Ironically, we're holding this festival, so, but that, that is the reality of, of uh, the, the pandemic life at the moment. Uh, but yeah, w- were you surprised to see that uh, so many listeners actually joined? Yes, <laughs> we were surprised. Uh, Zoom has a, a limit. You can have up to a thousand people connected with cameras. And for the first party, we had a... 1,300 people registered. And at some point there were almost 800 people connected at the same time with cameras on, listening, dancing, putting signs. And there is a very nice feature in Zoom that you can do spotlight. So you can select any camera, any, any participant and highlight it. So it will appear big in the screen for everybody. So it, was, it is like in the stadium where you see like the camera focus on someone on the, on the seats and they were like, oh, so excited, so happy. So we, we did that all the party and it was beautiful because people were expecting to, be, to appear and to be shown and to present themselves to others. And the second party, it was almost 900 people at the same time connected. And today is our third party tonight for me that, it's, that will happen in eight hours. Uh, and that will be our third party. And yeah, we are expecting like a thousand people and it will be very, very fun. And if you see in social media of Radio Ambulante right now, if you go to the Twitter of, of Radio Ambulante, you, you will see gifts of the previous parties. You will see, uh, you will read people talking about how anxious they are to join tonight's party because it's becoming this kind of expected event. And yeah, it was something that we didn't expect it. We, we just wanted to be joined by some very, very engaged listeners, but they brought their grandmas, they brought their pets, their children. And right now it's like a Latin American party that we are very excited and proud of. That sounds like so much fun. I almost feel like, well, it will be in the middle of the night of Bulgaria. I don't, I don't speak Spanish, so uh, I'm not a typical listener of Radio Ambulante, but I feel like joining that Zumba party. Um, I just wanted to go back to that initial idea. You mentioned how important it is to ask ourselves as, let's say, as journalists, as podcast creators, mm-hmm. Uh, Who are the voices left out? So uh, when Carolina was starting and Daniel, uh, the the podcast, uh, what do you think were the stories that were uh, like that were untold and that were left out at that that point that needed to be told? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that it was mostly all of our stories were being untold because they were usually told by reporters, well-intended reporters, or told by maybe American outlets covering Latin America. And the stories told by their, by their characters, by, the, by those who lived them, were being mostly ignored. There was not a space. There was not a space anywhere. Uh, that where you could find them. So there, there was also this kind of, there is still this kind of obsession with telling stories from Latin America about migration, right? That's like the big topic. And it's a very, very important topic. I don't want to dismiss it, but other kind of stories of, of, about Latin America, like, I don't know, 
gender or about uh, women's rights or about sports, they were not that important in the, in the media agenda, right? They were secondary. So Raya Mulante, from the very beginning, decided to tell any kind of story, any kind of story, if it is somehow, if, if it represents somehow Latin American identities. And when you, you think about it that way, the, the scoop or the broad of stories that you can tell is, is immense, right? It's huge. So yeah, those, those were the kind of stories that they were listening, that they were trying to tell. And recently, we, this is something that we're going to talk later, uh, to talk tomorrow, but every year, every year we do a survey, a listener, listener survey, because we want to know how the needs of Radio Ambulante uh, can meet the needs of our community, of our listeners. So we interview, like we, did this, we do this service every year, and last year uh, we got a very like frequent feedback or a very, yeah, there was a very important feedback that was like, friends, we love Radio Ambulante, but your stories sometimes are so sad, right? Like, yeah, I do want, I do want to listen about human rights and like uh, these abuses of power, they're important, but the world is so sad right now that I don't want to be sad. So sometimes I'm skipping Radio Ambulante episodes and we were like, oh my God, this is true. This is true. Like we don't want to make people even sadder. Like the world is enough. So we, because of that survey, we are doing more personal stories, more uplifting stories. And you see the numbers, like you see that in the numbers, people are engaging more and are grateful for that. And yeah, so the, the stories that we tell are <laughs> very, very huge. I can definitely relate to that, especially at a time of a pandemic when you need a little bit of a reprieve and some pick me up kind of, of stories. Yeah. Um, we have a question in the chat about how did uh, joining NPR's network, um, uh, what kind of impact it had on your editorial process and uh, decision making? Well, it did not have any editorial impact because we have in the editorial independence. Like NPR has no say on the stories that we tell, not at all. And the biggest impact was that our audience became much, much larger. And when your audience become larger, if you have someone on your team or if you have a team inside your organization that is working with the audience, with the community, uh, you will get more feedback and you will be able to use that feedback to inform your editorial decisions. So because the audience went larger and we had like, and I came to the team to listen to the, to the community, then we were able to take those kind of decisions like, hey, we need more uplifting stories, right? So, so that's the, the most important impact. And in terms of, of, of revenue, of course, it's essential because NPR has allowed us to have a stability and they're great. Like they're, they are very great partners in this because they, took, they take care of ourselves. They want us to keep growing, uh, but, but no editorially. Like editorially, we are independent. Right. And, um... Well, lastly, I mean, your team works remotely because you are based in different countries. Uh, would you say you were more prepared to deal with the pandemic and how it changed your workflow because of that? Or there are still challenges? It was like for us, and this is something that I made like, I'm very ashamed of saying, but for us, it, it was not disruptive at all. Like, We've been working like that since 2012. Like I've been in the team for three and a half years, and this is my day to day. Zoom is my life. Zoom is my house, right? I, I should decorate it because it is like I I spend all day here, and 
like our team dynamics are used to this. Like we, we use Zoom for meetings, we have Dropbox for, for editing the episodes in real time. We do Drive for all the documents and the scripts. This is how we work. So fortunately, the pandemic was not disruptive in terms of the way we work. Of course, it was because many of us are, are fathers or mothers and we have our kids here at home every day. And yeah, it's disruptive and it's horrible, but not in terms of how we do what we do. Right. If you can share one takeaway, maybe for those who are struggling uh, to work remotely and, I mean, produce a podcast. <sighs> <laughs> That's a difficult one, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's a difficult one. Like, I think in, in this kind of, of job, I think in any job, like, it's how good, like, how good are your communications? Uh, it's directly related to how successful you will be. So because we're not in this space, in this physical space where we can see the faces of our colleagues and see if they're in a good mood or in a bad mood. And like, sometimes you go to the office and you, you know by the energy if something good is happening, if the mood is low or high, and then you, you adapt yourself and you, you know how to navigate. In Zoom, in, in Slack, we, you have no idea. You have no idea. So you have to be very, very clear on your communications. You have to be very well organized on, on what you're doing and how you're doing it and when you have to deliver. But for us, like that's life. I think the podcast, the, the greatest podcasts that I know are those who are super professional. Like this is something that, like the podcast universe is enormous. And there are excellent podcasts, podcasts that are innovating, that are opening like new roads. And there are average podcasts. And that's like the, the biggest share of them because not because people who produce them are not talented, but maybe because they do it as a side job, right? It's, they do it as something that is secondary. And when I was talking about the story of Ambulante and I told you that for five years they were not getting a salary, even though they were not getting a salary and they had to do other things, the main thing for them was Radio Ambulante, right? And I think that if you want to create a podcast that will make a difference, you have to take it very, very seriously because it is not easy at all. It seems easy. It seems easy to turn on a microphone and edit a couple of interviews and publish it. But to create a, a, a good podcast, you have to have so many, many, many layers and so many checks in the box. Uh, we were doing this when we launched Elido. Uh, we did a checklist of all the things that we needed from zero to publish. And it was like 130 things that we needed to do to launch a successful podcast. And right now, Elito in nine months has a, half, a million and a half downloads. It's very successful uh, for us. So it's, if you take it seriously and professionally, you will, it's, it's very probable that people will recognize that immediately. Thank you so much, Jorge, uh, for being with us tonight. It was a fascinating uh, presentation with uh, lots of insights, and I hope uh, many people will be inspired. Looking forward to the workshop tomorrow. And now stay with us because we'll have like a six-minute break, and then we'll come back uh, with a panel called Both Female Voices, and this is the time when women will take over uh, the, the festival. We have some amazing speakers, and we'll talk about the importance of female uh, voices in, in podcasting. Again, uh, the streaming is going on on YouTube and Facebook, and we'll be back in, in five minutes. So uh, grab a drink and, and stay with us. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you. And Thank uh, enjoy everyone. the Zumba party tonight. <laughs> yeah, if you want to join, I will, I will share the link here in the chat. Just if you're curious and you want to Great. replicate that. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.